Okay, so for this chapter, we're going to look at the forces of evolutionary change. So what is evolution? Evolution explains the features of all organisms, from microbes to humans. When life started on this planet, it started off as simple little organisms, single-celled organisms in the water. And those organisms continue to evolve all the way up to the various uh, higher order organisms, such as humans. Um, evolution is a way for organisms to adapt to ever-changing environments as well. Uh, environments will change, conditions will change, and if the organism cannot adapt to those changes, they risk the potential of uh, extinguishing out. So evolution occurs when there are changes in heritable traits from generation to generation. In one of the chapters, previous chapters, you guys learned about DNA. And it's changes within those genes and DNA that leads to ultimately evolutionary changes. Now, some of these changes can lead to the development of different species as well. Evolution does not occur in individuals since an individual's alleles do not change. In a population, allele frequencies will change from one generation to the next over time. So you personally will not see any evolutionary changes, but as the species evolves, that's when you can start to see some changes. Some alleles will become more common in a population. Others will become less common. Allele frequencies will vary between populations as well. So for example, in the population of Asia, the frequency of alleles that produce black hair is high. And the allele frequency can be calculated by the following equation. So you would take the number of the copies of an allele and divide that by the total number of alleles in the same gene in the population. And that'll give you your overall frequency. It's essentially a percentage uh, that you're, you're determining here. Now, evolution is detectable by examining gene pools. In a population of Sweden, the frequency of alleles that produce black hair is low. The gene pool for a population in Sweden differs from that from the population of Asia. If Swedish people, if, sorry, if Swedish people migrate to Asia and interbreed with local people, then the allele frequencies in the gene pool of Asia will change because now you're introducing a new gene pool per se, new alleles uh, into the equation. And this is how evolution can occur. Now, many scientists uh, starting back from Aristotle all the way up through Darwin and Wallace um, have contributed to the theory of evolution. Um, with Aristotle, individuals and the species are basically identical and species are unchanging. Obviously, we know that's not the case. Uh, Hutton, uh, he came up with changes in nature are gradual and with the term uh, uniformitarianism. Uh, Cuvier, uh, species will reappear after catastrophic fossils represents uh, after cat catastrophes, sorry. Uh, fossils represent extin extinctions. Um, and then all the way up through Darwin, which probably most of you have heard of, uh, and Wallace, uh, individuals in a population are different. Uh, species arise through the process of natural selection. Um, so fossils ultimately will provide evidence for slow change over time. Studying the geology demonstrates Cuvier's principles of superposition. Fossils of extinct species in old layers of rock can suggest that living organisms have evolved from common ancestors. Uh, so you, you're sort of examining, you know, newer rock layers to older rock layers. And the deeper and deeper you get, you can sort of see what was present uh, prior and how they may have looked and how they are different from current. Uh, members of the same species if they're not extinct. The stage was set for Darwin and Wallace. Uh, Lamarck uh, proposed testable ideas about how species can change. And he essentially stated that new species will come from existing species through environmental forces. Uh, essentially what that means is due to changes in the environment, that's where you'll see these changes. 
or these pressures that are being placed, that's where you'll sort of uh, gain some of this uh, ability to adapt. Lyell uh, said that Earth must be very old since natural process occurs very slowly and all changes in nature are gradual. And this ultimately renewed the uniformitarianism uh, philosophy. Now Darwin's voyage provided evidence for evolution. Charles Darwin's documented the great variety of organisms in South America and their relationships to fossils and geology. He began to think that these were clues to how new species originate. Charles Darwin studied finches in the Galapagos Islands. He saw that their beak types matched up with the foods that they ate. Darwin thought this different finch species all descended from the same finch ancestor. Uh, but, you know, again, if food is located in a particular area and in order for you to access that food, you need to have certain anatomical features, most likely your body would adapt to that or the, the organism's uh, structure would adapt to that. Um, Darwin saw that the environment of each island influenced the survival and reproduction of the finches that were living there. Finches with features best suited to the environment uh, were able to survive and reproduce better than others. So the logic of natural selection. Uh, natural selection uh, is going to select for, uh, or nature is going to select for reproductive success. The, this is what we call natural selection. Observations of nature, genetic variation, Within a species, no two individuals except identical siblings are exactly alike. There is some of this variation is heritable. Limited resource. Every habitat contains limited supplies of resources that are required for survival. Overproduction of the offspring. More individuals are born than survive to reproduce. And then there were some inferences from observations the struggle for existence. Individuals compete for limited resources that enable them to survive. Uh, unequal reproductive success, natural selection, the inherited characteristics of some individuals make them more likely to obtain resources, survive and reproduce. And what that means is that um, the weak may not necessarily survive. Uh, and then descent with modification. Uh, over many generations, a population's characteristics can change by natural selection, even giving rise to new species. So artificial selection changes allele frequencies. If we look at a mild mustard plant here, um, populations show a variety of different traits. Plant breeders bred mustard plants with traits they liked, leading to different vegetable varieties. Artificial selection or selective breeding also helped Darwin form the theory of evolution by natural selection. You see this with dogs. You have where you take uh, several species of dogs and you make new species out of them. Uh, this is done in agriculture all the time where they'll take, you know, maybe some nice components of one type of an apple and blend it or uh, breed it with another type of an apple to sort of create a new apple. Uh, humans artificially alter allele frequencies. In artificial selection, a human chooses desired features, then allows only the individuals that best express those qualities to reproduce. This increases the frequency of desired alleles in a population. So this is where we're taking it a little bit out of the natural part. It may also amplify the frequency of undesired alleles associated with heter hereditary health problems, such as in, the, in cases of extensive inbreeding of purebred dogs. Now, a lot of evolutionary theory is supported by data. Over the years, a large body of careful research has corroborated and expanded on Darwin's findings. 
So Darwin published his first uh, book on the origin of species, which is a very famous book, essentially um, talks about evolution and the main gist is survival of the fittest. Um, and here we can see uh, a timeline um, of evolution over the years, uh, all the way up to even the 1950s when DNA was discovered and then how mutations within the DNA uh, sort of lead to these changes. And these are some things we'll talk about. So natural selection molds evolution. Natural selection does not create alleles. Instead, it strongly selects for alleles that arise by chance. Each generation, the best camouflaged seahorses survive to reproduce. As you can see here, uh, this seahorse is blending into the coral so that it doesn't necessarily get eaten by a predator. Uh, the alleles conferring camouflage become more frequent within each generation because the ones that are able to camouflage are going to survive versus the ones that are not. And the ones that are surviving are increasing your overall um, uh, gene pool uh, for, the, for those alleles. Since more individuals are born than resources can support, the struggle to survive is inevitable. Some individuals in a population are better than others at surviving and reproducing. Now, adaptations enhance reproductive success. Adaptations are heritable features that provide a selective advantage because they improve an organism's ability to survive and reproduce. So this flower tastes bad, so the plant is not eaten by predators. Bacteria undergo natural selection. Bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics have an adaptive trait that is non-resistant bacteria lack. When antibiotics are administered, resistant bacteria survive and reproduce, while the non-resistant bacteria will end up dying off. One of the virtual labs that you're doing explores this overall concept. And essentially what's gonna happen is, if all the bacteria that are going to be susceptible to the bacteria, or susceptible to the antibiotic die off, the ones you're left with are the ones where you have antibiotic resistance. And if those bacteria grow, it's going to increase overall in the population. This is going to allow resistant alleles to become more frequent in the population over time. Antibiotics cannot create a resistance allele. The variation in resistance was already present in the population. Adaptations will also enhance reproductive success. The porcupine fish is a medium-sized fish that cannot swim very fast. When threatened, it inflates and has sharp spines. These defenses are adaptations, heritable traits that increase the chances that the fish will survive long enough to reproduce. And one thing that's for sure is that evolution never stops. As environmental conditions change, the phenotypes that natural selection favors will also change. Uh, so let me take a moment here just to uh, define a term here. Genotype, G-E-N-O-T-Y-P-E, -E, is a term that's used to describe the sequence for the DNA. Phenotype is the expressed version of the gene. So for example, you have a gene that's going to dictate that you have blue eyes in the DNA. That's the genotype. The fact that you have blue eyes, that's the expressed version of the genotype. So the blue eyes feature would be the phenotype. So adaptations that seem perfect in one environment would be completely wrong in another. Evolution does not have a goal. This orchid and its wasp pollinator have evolved alongside one another for long enough that no other animal can pollinate the flower. But the orchid does not evolve in order to be better pollinated by the wasp. Neither the orchid nor natural selection has foresight. Instead, orchids that are best suited to the wasp pollination are the most likely to reproduce, so their alleles get passed on to the next generation more frequently than those that are not. And this brings up the term survival of the fittest. 
fitness describes an organism's genetic contribution to the next generation. Orchids that are best suited to the wasp pollination are the most fit because they are most likely to reproduce. So their alleles will get passed to the next generation most often. Now let's look at some misconceptions about uh, evolutionary theory. Uh, first misconception is biological evolution explains the origins of life. Biological evolution did not begin until life existed. Evolution is a random process. Some mechanisms of evolution, such as mutations, do occur randomly. However, natural selection is non-random because the environment selects against poorly adapted individuals. In a changing environment, all individuals in a population simultaneously develop beneficial adaptations. That's the third misconception. And adaptations become fixed in a population over multiple generations, as individuals with beneficial adaptations are most likely to survive, reproduce, and pass their genes to the next generation. So fitness is a reproductive success. Fitness includes surviving, reproducing, and having offspring that survive to reproduce. Even if an organism does not survive, fitness means that its alleles will. And scientists can test evolution. Scientists test evolution against null hypotheses, which state that allele frequencies do not change from one generation to the next. Evolution is not only possible, it is unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, uh, unavoidable. In this ferret population, the alleles D, capital D and lowercase d, confer the phenotype of fur color. Capital D is dark fur, which is dominant over light fur. 64 of the 100 ferrets have dark fur, 36 have light fur. Hardy Warnberg uh, came up with an equation that, and his equation uh, essentially is testing Hardy Weinberg equilibrium is the unlikely situation in which allele frequencies do not change between generations. So he essentially stated that at equilibrium, allele frequencies do not change. Hardy Weinberg equilibrium occurs only if a population meets the following assumption. Natural selection does not occur, which is not gonna happen. There are no mutations, again, highly unlikely. The population is large enough to eliminate random changes in allele frequencies. Individuals mate at random and no migration. So this is essentially at equilibrium, you'll see no changes in allele frequencies, essentially in a closed vacuum, but nature is not a closed vacuum. So two equations allow us to collect, calculate uh, allele frequencies. Assuming the assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium are met, two equations represent the relationship between the allele frequencies and the genotype frequencies. The first is P plus Q equals one. P is the frequency of the dominant allele. Q is the frequency of the recessive allele. Again, in this case, the dominant allele being dark color fur, the recessive allele being light color fur. Second equation is P squared plus two PQ equals Q squared, which equals uh, one. Sorry, this is a typo here. This should actually be uh, P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared equals one. Uh, so uh, please correct this. This equal sign here should be a plus sign. So scientists count up the alleles to calculate the frequencies. So since the dark hair, dark fur gene has two alleles, the frequency of the dominant allele plus the frequency of the recessive allele must equal one. P is the frequency of the dominant allele, Q is the frequency of the recessive allele. So here, if we have, um, If you look at the sort of the, the breakdown here, if you have, uh, you know, different combinations where you have capital D, lowercase, or capital D, capital D, because uh, again, you're getting one allele from mom, one allele from dad. You can have capital D, lowercase d, 
capital D, lowercase d, and lowercase d, lowercase d. Uh, so essentially what's going to happen here is you can determine the allele frequencies, but if once you determine the allele frequencies by counting up the different variations, you need to add these up and they need to equal one. So scientists count up the alleles to calculate the frequencies. Multiplying the frequencies of the dominant allele by itself gives the frequency of homozygous dominant individuals in the next generation. Multiplying the frequency of the recessive alleles by itself gives the frequency of the homozygous recessive individuals in the next generation. The frequency of the dominant allele times the frequency of the recessive allele times two gives the frequency of heterozygous individuals in the next generation. Uh, so again, just to sort of define some things here, heterozygous means you have one dominant, one recessive. Uh, homozygous would be either having both dominant or both recessive. Allele frequencies are always going to change. Hardy-Warnberg equilibrium is a useful model, but in real populations, the assumptions of Hardy-Warnberg are always going to be violated, meaning you can't stay within those rules. Natural selection and mutations do occur. Random changes in allele frequencies are common. Individuals will rarely mate at random, and there is always some level of migration between populations. So natural selection can shape populations in many ways. Three modes of natural selection, you have directional, disruptive, and stabilizing. Uh, and they are distinguished by their effects on the phenotypes of a population. Directional selection favors one phenotype over another. So the black moths survive and reproduce more than light moths in this example. Disruptive selection favors extreme phenotypes. Very light and very dark snails both survive and reproduce more than intermediate colored snails. And in a third example, stabilizing selection favors intermediate phenotypes. Very light and very dark snails both survive and reproduce more than the intermediate colored snails. In the second example. So why are harmful alleles sometimes maintained in a population? One explanation for why harmful alleles persist in a population is heterozygote advantage, in which a heterozygote is favored over homozygotes. The sickle cell allele is harmful. It causes sickle cell disease. For example, heterozygotes for sickle cell allele do not actually have sickle cell disease, and they are protected against malaria. However, if you have two heterozygotes mate and their child uh, ends up becoming a homozygous, uh, then they can have sickle cell disease. So there's the advantage of with the sickle cell by being heterozygous for sickle cell because it protects you against malaria, but if you do run the risk of developing a homozygote where you can end up having the disease. So sexual selection directly influences reproductive success. Building complex nests flashing showy plumage and budding heads with rival males all appear to waste energy. So how can natural selection allow for traits that apparently reduce survival? Well, sexual selection results from variation in the ability to attain mates. Sexual selection results either from competition for access to the other sex, that is these rams, or from one sex choosing attractive mates of the other sex. In some population, there is fierce competition for mating. Intersexual selection occurs in when the stronger individual in a population battle to win access to mates. The weaker individuals are denied access. In some populations, individuals choose the best mates. Intersexual selection occurs when members of one sex choose mates with the highest quality features. Sexual selection uh, causes evolution to occur. Individuals with sexually selective traits meet the most and therefore pass along their genes most. Mating is not random. Since Hardy-Weinberg does not apply, evolution occurs. And here we're gonna talk about mutations now because mutations are really where evolution sort of takes its place. 
Okay, so mutations were one of the major causes of evolution to occur. Essentially, mutations are going to create genetic diversity. Mutations are random changes in the sequence of DNA. They can be harmful, but many are harmless, and actually some can be beneficial. Beneficial mutations are passed on to the next generation, so their frequency increases over the generations. Genetic drift causes evolution to occur. Genetic drift is a random sampling error. Allele frequencies can shift dramatically and often become eliminated when only part of a population survives to reproduce. So if you have a, uh, a, um, a ball of marbles and you have 50 orange and 50 blue marbles and you randomly pick out 10, um, and uh, the random sample is seven to three, your new uh, allele frequency would be 70 to 30. Uh, and then if you randomly pick them out, now you're nine to one. So you can sort of see this genetic drift occurring. The founder effect causes genetic drift. When only a few individuals establish a new population, the allele frequency might change. This process illustrates the founder effect. Population bottlenecks can also cause genetic drift. A population bottleneck occurs if a disaster drastically reduces the size of the population. Uh, and that's... Um, And then non-rating mating causes evolution to occur. Sexual selection and artificial selection can alter mating patterns in a population and prevent random mating from occurring. So gene flow uh, causes evolution to occur as well. Gene flow moves, moves alleles between populations. This might affect the allele frequencies in both populations. Migration causes gene flow and ultimately reduces genetic differences between populations. And evolution is altered by allele frequencies. So investigating life, size matters in a fishy frenzy. Uh, in this case, in this example, Evolution mean, by means of natural selection has practical applications, such as establishing fishing regulations. For years, humans have been only removing large fish from a population. And the fish harvesting affects the average fish size. Researchers established three populations applied the following treatments, removing large fish, removing random fish, and removing small fish. And after just four generations of evolution could be measured, the large harvested population had much lower average weight than the small harvest population. The frequency of alleles for the large size decreased because again, they were being hunted and for them to change, uh, that was uh, the way to sort of fix that. <laughs> Uh, fish in their large harvested population develop more slowly than those in small harvested populations. And the frequency for the alleles uh, or fast development decreased. So uh, sort of bringing this up to a close here, uh, and I'll post up some supplemental videos on these topics as well. Um, is that, you know, evolution is ultimate going to happen. Uh, and, you know, these are changes that are necessary for ever-changing environments.